And so once again, today we're going to talk about the biggest mysteries that science cannot solve, at least uh, not yet. Even though, as I'm going to show you, there was a huge progress, um, and I'm going to show you some of the biggest um, mysteries that were resolved recently, but still there is a lot to discover, maybe for you in the future, which is a good news, uh, because uh, humans have travel to the moon, uh, we are almost, we have almost reached uh, Mars, um, we uncovered the secrets of um, Bermuda Triangle, maybe even to some extent the pyramids of Egypt, but there is still plenty of phenomena that science cannot explain, at least not yet. Uh, despite decades or even centuries of uh, of research, so it's not that. Some of them appeared recently because with more answers we get actually more uh, questions as well. So, so today's lesson is going to be dedicated to what we have yet to discover in various uh, domains. Uh, first I'd like to um, begin with something that is not going to be the main focus of the lesson, so some of the Mm, secrets, almost like um, um, legends or uh, sometimes referred to as fake science. Maybe it's not uh, fake uh, entirely, but these are mostly archaeological um, mysteries that inspire a lot of conspiracy theories. For example, I don't know if you have heard in the archaeology domain, about Antilope Springs footprint. This is supposed to be a footprint, actually a human footprint with a boot, with a sandal, found in a very, very old rock, identified as an old 500 million years old formation, even with trilobits in it. So uh, it was discovered in 1968. An amateur geologist, or more like a fossil hunter, um, discovered in, in this area of Antelope Springs um, during the family vacation something that looks actually like a, like a footprint, footprint with, with sandal, and it looks like someone stepped on a trilobit. A trilobit looks like, uh, looks like this. So researchers, of course, were interested in the discovery and they found that the fossil has been formed about 500 million to 590 million years ago. Um, so they found some mudstone and probably someone walked upon it. But how is it possible that a human was, uh, could walk upon it 500 million years ago? Um, well, so it's, it would be impossible since um, humans did not appear until uh, humans at, at least in civilization who, that, who, who wear sandals didn't appear uh, until the thousands of years, tens of thousands of years ago. So this, uh, for now, this mystery remains unsolved. How, this, how is it possible? There are many such artifacts who are believed to prove that uh, human civilization, developed civilization, appeared long before we even know that there was such civilization. Another one is more human-made, and we know exactly where it came from. It's so-called cryptos, but still it's a, it's a riddle that inspires a lot of people as something unsolvable. It's actually a sculpture. The sculpture looks like this, quite, quite normal. This, this sculpture was made by American artists, and it's actually located in the um, premises of CIA, Central Intelligence Agency in Virginia. Uh, it, it's not old, it was um, made in 1990. And it, why does it cause so much questions and was it the challenge or why does it cause so many speculations? Well, the speculations are about the meaning of the messages that are encrypted in this, uh, in, in this culture. There's a code a part of it look, looks like this. Uh, actually, the three messages have been already sold, but the fourth message remains like one of the most famous unsolved codes 
in the world. So it's like more, uh, we know there is a solution, we know it's human made, it's not like there are extraterrestrials or something like that, uh, but it remains the interest of uh, cryptographs, cryptoanalysts, amateur and professional, who are attempting to decipher this fourth, uh, fourth, fourth message. And um, actually, the artist is still alive and gives uh, some clues. Another, <clears throat> another example of uh, of maybe fake or real um, artifact, ecological artifact, are so called crystal skulls. Crystal skulls look like this. And uh, they are thought, or they, are, they were claimed to come from uh, pre-Columbian uh, pre times. Uh, from, so they were supposed to be created by ancient Mesoamerican civilization. Uh, some say they're relics of legendary Atlantis, or maybe a proof that actually extraterrestrials uh, visited Aztec sometime before the, uh, the, the Spanish conquest because uh, it is said that they would be impossible to be created with this material at this time. But actually, uh, most of the studies show that um, those, that those, those skulls that were examined by, um, by scientists were manufactured, were produced in 19th century or later, almost certainly in Europe. And so uh, when, at the time when interest in this ancient um, Mesoamerican culture was abandoned, so it's most likely a fake, but of course there are lots of um, conspiracy theories saying that, for example, UFO visited Aztecs. And the same with Egyptians. I mentioned that the uh, mystery of how pyramids were built um, is more or less solved, uh, but some are still not entirely convinced. So. Uh, the pyramids were constructed between two, two and a half thousand, around two and a half thousand years before Christ. Christ. So uh, there would be a wonder of engineering even now, in the, even if they had been built today. But uh, considering the level of development of engineering at that time, how did those Asian people uh, manage it? That is that is the question. So. There are some legitimate scientists who believe that, again, aliens, extraterrestrials from another planet must have been um, involved. Well, the others explain that there were ramps, there was wet sand, there were pulleys. So uh, what we do know that we don't know 100% how the construction, uh, what this, the construction uh, looks like. And of course, every day you can encounter some events, some trivia events that are um, difficult to explain, uh, just like those octopuses found crawling in a Welsh speech. I'll show you a short video. So more or less there was uh, the event that one night hundreds of octopuses went out of the sea, went to the land, and there was no sign of any kind of pollution or catastrophe. So uh, it's still a mystery to the scientists what uh, triggered this event. But actually it's one of those events that we just don't know yet, but they're usually one-time uh, events, but they uh, attract attention of media. Uh, usually. So the question is, in terms of science, do we know all that it is to be known? Well, uh, we thought we knew everything rather early. Uh, in the, at the beginning of 20th century, famous physicist, Lord Kelvin, known for Kelvin degrees, uh, temperature degrees, uh, he claimed that there is nothing new to be discovered in physics now. Well, we very much know it's not true. So uh, even though we think it's 
uh, it's rather uh, we rather our knowledge is, is maybe maybe full or certainly much more developed than more than 100 years ago. Still, there is so much uh, uh, so much to discover. So we should remain humble in this term and uh, know that we do not know everything. Okay, so there is a question for you. Actually, five questions. Uh, that science, contrary to those that we'll talk about in a minute, that science gives you answers to. So I'm waiting for your guesses in chat box, or if you wish, we can use a microphone and unmute you. Uh, so what does science say about it? In a minute, we're going to give the explanation. So why is the sky blue? Classic one. How much does the sky weigh? And it's not a tricky question. Uh, how do airplanes stay in the air? Many people wonder that, especially sitting in the airplane. Why is water wet? And why is the sun the only star that can be seen in a day, during the daytime? Okay, so uh, you can choose one question or find answers to all of them that if, if, you, if you can. Maybe you know the answer given by science, or just um, you may also give your wild guesses. Okay, maybe with the sky. This is this one is rather easy or rather well known. So why is the sky blue? Let me show you a little bit of the clue. So the sky isn't really blue. It looks blue. It's really made up of all the colors of the rainbow, actually it would be more like purple. So each of these colors has a different wavelength. And some are smooth wavelengths, some are choppy uh, wavelengths, and blue light is like choppy, so it's short, it's very, very short. UV is even shorter. So uh, if it's a very short, it's get it gets um, scattered on and reflected in the atmosphere. They collide with gases, with particles. So the blue collides with everything. It's very short. So that's why it seems um, blue. The sky seems blue. It's not because the ocean reflects it in the sky. It's not like that. Uh, so actually, we we'll think about violet or purple. It's sky really purple because the UV, ultraviolet, um, is even shorter than blue so it should be even more scattered so it is it is more scattered but we do not see it because our human eyes are not um, capable of seeing UV uh, UV uh, UV radiation okay sure I can see a good answer okay so back to other uh, questions. For example, uh, how much does the sky weigh? It's a bit of a tricky. I'm not expecting a number, but rather, how would you weigh the sky? We can put, you cannot put it on a scale. So we, how we weigh it is with atmospheric pressure. So the atmospheric pressure is about 6.6 .6 kilograms per scratch. And uh, the surface of the air of the earth, the area is about five hundred million, five hundred ten million square kilometers. So the entire weight of the sky would be like five five point two billion metric tons. So we cannot put on a scale, but we know how, exactly how much the Earth is, um, how much the air surrounding the uh, the Earth weighs. Uh, actually, there is another way of looking uh, on it, more um, more artistic maybe. There is a British or United Kingdom Science and Technology uh, Facilities Council, and it describes they describe how much the sky weighs as an equivalent of number of Indian elephants. So they, the measure is, oh, a lot, 570 and 
12 zeros adult um, Indian elephant. So uh, with that way, it's surprising that we don't feel like it's pressing us uh, from all directions. But this is uh, because we're used to it. Our bodies are used to it. We live under this weight from since the beginning of our lives. And so we have necessary muscles that carry this weight. And for example, if we were grown uh, on another planet with less air, with um, less heavy atmosphere, that then that we'd go to Earth, the weight of the air would be very, very heavy for us. Very fatiguing. So luckily it's not, uh, it's not the case. So another question was, why is water wet? But actually it's not. Well, wet is the word that we apply to water, but what we feel as wetness when we touch water, it's not wetness, it's actually coldness, because the water evaporates, so we, so we feel, uh, so we feel that, it, that it's cold. So this is, this is why the water seems to be wet, because it evaporates and there is, there is cold. Uh, what else did we have? Uh, oh, okay, why is the sun the only the only star that we see during the day. First, it's very, uh, this, is, this one is easy. It's quite close to us, and the other stars are also glowing during the day, but the brightness and the closeness of the sun is uh, so big that it makes it impossible. Uh, so yeah, also the light coming from the sun, again, is scattered into bright blue color. And we are familiar with it because we know it as a sky color. So this blue atmosphere that we perceive as blue is blocking out the stars. And they seem to shine very faintly, even though they shine normally during the day. OK, so much for, uh, for some of the answers to everyday questions, or maybe more like quiz questions that um, that science offers us answers to. Uh, so now back to the mysteries. So the answer is that we're still struggling, to, struggling to uh, to give. And the first one is a very basic one. So actually, we know a lot about the universe. We observe the stars, but what is the universe made of? If you think about it. Uh, so it's the the majority is rather unknown. So what you, when you see the composition here, then uh, the, here is dark energy, like 72%, dark matter, 23%. And the rest, like heavy elements, like Earth, for example, is only 0.03% of, of the mass, um, composition of the universe mass. So, uh, so we don't know, really. Um, and for the last 40 years, there is the dilemma, the dilemma that astronomers uh, face. And they're trying to determine what is building, what's, what are the building blocks, building elements of the universe. And so before they thought that the universe contained like normal matter, which is stuff you can, you can see. And this seems rather obvious, billions of galaxies, in each galaxy, there are billions of stars around some planets, moons, so a normal matter, what you see. And in between uh, those large bodies, uh, there are some irregular shaped objects, like tiny particles, uh, uh, meteorites, and so on. So all this matter is so-called baryonic matter. And then, of course, there, is, there are atoms. In it. Uh, so they're like no normal stuff, but the rest, like dark energy or dark matter, is the unknown. The, actually, actually, the uh, scientists can tell you what dark energy and dark matter is not, not what it is. We cannot define it, we cannot touch it or, um, or measure it in, uh, in any way. And speaking about dark matter, uh, another very important and also, I would say, popular and fashionable subject would be uh, the black hole. Look at what you can see, I think you can recognize the first ever actual photo of the black hole, actually comparing with some of the 
um, images that were created before, it may even look a little bit disappointing. Uh, so we have a photo, thanks to, well, it looks like a black hole in a light ring, surely. Uh, so what happens inside a black hole remains totally unknown. It doesn't mean that scientists are not trying to find out. The problem is they cannot do it empirically, so they only have to count and calculate. So black holes look like this, apparently, and there are places in space uh, where the gravity is very, very strong, and it's so strong that even light cannot escape. So if the light cannot escape, Mm, the, the no one has ever been able to see or say what happens inside the black hole because nothing comes back from, from the black hole. Uh, actually, Stephen Hawking, late Stephen Hawking, he theorized that um, information from within a black hole actually remains not inside the black hole but outside of it. And so it would be theoretically accessible. And it would be stored in the so-called event horizon. Event horizon would be uh, like a margin, like a border. So you can go only as far as to the event horizon. And after that, after crossing that line, you would be sucked in by the, uh, by the black hole, because there must be some point at which you you will be sucked by the energy. That gravity is so strong. Otherwise, if there was no such point, think about it. The Earth and every other planet, everything in the universe would have to be sucked in. So there has to be some safe space and then some point at which the gravity is so strong it sucks in uh, everything that you can't uh, even uh, escape. So what happens inside, we totally don't know, and we don't have the tools to answer, unfortunately. Of course, many people, the, the best scientists, the, the most famous ones, were trying to give the answer and were giving some, uh, some theoretical answers. Uh, so Einstein's um, general relativity theory that um, says that when a black hole is created, that means it's created because of some massive star that is dying and collapsing, and this is what remains, the, the black, bleak, black hole. Um, actually, the theory was that it continues to, getting, to get smaller and smaller until it forms something that was infinitely small. What is infinitely small? A point is infinitely small. Uh, it's called a point, of singularity or singularity. So it's indefinitely small. And this is where we step from normal physics to quantum physics. And again, it's just a, just a theory, but provided by a very sm uh, famous scientist. So uh, one that we could definitely um, think might be, uh, might be true. Uh, so there is also a recent idea and the recent idea is called so-called M theory. I'll maybe write it down to for you. So it's M theory. Okay, wasn't too. The recent one is M theory. Mm. Um, it might explain that uh, one day, of course, might explain that unseen center of this point, of this, of this black hole. Uh, so, it says that the, what would happen in, if you stepped into a black hole? Uh, the theory says you wouldn't feel anything, you'd actually be in a free fall. And this free fall actually Einstein once called the happiest thought of all. So, at the same time, it exists, and inevitably, you wouldn't exist. And the mass would be added to, would, would turn into this uh, black hole. Something that we are likely not going to um, test, 
and uh, luckily are not going to experience uh, in a foreseeable uh, future. Okay, let's change sub subject, subject from the universe to something closer to us. So even though we know a lot about medicine, about the human body, about how our organism uh, works, we do not know how and why actually we're sleeping or dreaming or yawning for that matter. So if you look at this image of this lady yawning for a while, it's hard to resist not to, not to yawn too. Uh, so, first of all, uh, starting with yawning, no one can say for certain why we yawn. Actually, when I look at her, I can hardly stop myself from, from yawning as well. So, um, there is a theory that the yawning is some sort of thermal aggression. So, it's thermoregulatory behavior which cools down the brain. But actually, how it works and the true biological function is still unclear. We know we own when there is not enough oxygen in the air, when we're tired, when we're sleepy. But the actual mechanism um, is not known. And um, what's more, scientists aren't entirely sure why it's actually contagious. As, uh, contagious uh, among social animals, like humans. Like I said, if you stare at the lady for a while, definitely you would start yawning. Uh, so there was a study dedicated to it, a study published in 2005. It proved that um, there are some networks in our brain that are responsible for empathy, for social skills. And they're activated when you see someone yawn. Uh, so it was observed that even chimpanzees our cousins can catch can catch yawns for, from humans. So if you yawn and the chimpanzee observe us, they, they start yawning as well. So our empathy networks in brain are are probably um, turned on or triggered somehow. Uh, the theory says that copying those expressions, facial expressions, those behaviors helps us to understand other people, understand their current state, understand and adopt. And this is why, according to the study, psychopaths aren't able to do this contagious yawning, so they're not so skeptical to it. So if you keep yawning next to a psychopath and they don't react, so you know that they're psychopaths, uh, most likely with no empathy at all. So, uh, so yawning, and what happens after yawning? Sleeping. Well, that's one of the most mysterious phenomena of all in our body. Of course, not only in our body, we, we tend to think that humans sleep and maybe some other mammals sleep, but actually even worms um, uh, are able uh, to sleep, even not, not very complicated animals are sleeping. Mm, uh, well, considering how much time we spend doing it, about one third of our lives, you would assume that presume that mm, we would know everything about it. There are lots of studies dedicated to sleeping, uh, but the complete explanation of why we sleep and why we dream is not known. Um, there were the theories by a famous scientist, Sir Sigmund Freud. He believed that dreams, well, not, not sleeping as such, but dreams that we experience are expressions of our some wishes unfulfilled. Um, others believe that dreams are just random firing of sleeping brain. Uh, Actually, animal studies uh, lead us to understanding that um, dreaming can play a role in memory, in learning, uh, in emotions. And for example, rats that were tested, laboratory la rats, um, have been known to um, replay experiences in dreams. 
So uh, it was helping them to solve some complex tasks, such as navigating through uh, labyrinths, through, through mazes. So in a dream, they were looking for answers and um, pieces were, of puzzle were put in, in, um, in correct places. So probably this is why uh, some people claim that, uh, that they are able to um, write songs or poems or find solutions to some problem while asleep. Uh, and again, about dreaming. So the question if dreaming if dreams have physiological, biological, uh, psychological functions is yet to be answered. Answered. We know some things. We know that even though we do not remember our dreams, we do dream approximately three to six times per night. Uh, a dream sometimes. Um, seem like they last for hours, but a single dream lasts 5 to 20 minutes. And 95% are completely uh, forgotten. Like I said, just like with the rats, um, we, they can help us to learn and develop some long-term uh, memories. And also, uh, there, there's also sometimes a question, what, what about uh, disabled people like blind people? So do they uh, see in their dreams? Do they see colors? Uh, actually, they dream with other sensory com uh, components uh, than, uh, than, than, than sighted uh, people. So it's, it is actually uh, not a totally different uh, world, but more like a reflection of our awake um, life. We were in the uh, universe looking for some answers, but actually here on Earth we have a huge area that is yet to be discovered, and it's the ocean. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that 95% of the ocean is still unexplored. That seems like a lot. We don't know what's there. Uh, if we don't know what's there, we cannot use it, we cannot manage it. We uh, cannot predict the processes that go on there. Ninety-five percent of the ocean. So what's down there? Uh, in 1960, um, two um, explorers traveled traveled several kilometers down to the deepest parts of the ocean, searching for answers. Um, and their journey was something that that pushed the boundaries of how far humans can go. But still, it was just a glimpse of life that we can meet on the sea floor. Uh, of course, uh, it's very difficult to, to, why is it difficult to get to the bottom of the ocean? Uh, we have to send some um, unmanned vehicles, uh, not, not, not uh, boats or submarine uh, submarines or something like that with people. They had to be unmanned. And uh, we already made, in this 5% that we have explored, we have made extremely interesting discoveries, like bizarre fish um, with transparent heads, uh, and also some potential treatments, just like in the um, Amazonian uh, jungle, uh, Amazonian forest. Uh, so treatments for Alzheimer, for example, made by crustaceans. So what lies under those 95% is must be really, uh, really amazing. So uh, what we find there are external fields usually, so organisms that are used to more extreme uh, temperatures, pressure, uh, saltiness of water, and and so on. There are also some phenomena that we observe from the surface that are also not entirely explained, like something that's called Milky Sea phenomenon. And it's actually, it has been observed for a long time, but for a long time, uh, people thought that it was just an imagination of, uh, of sailors. But actually, it is not. It is probably caused by a luminescent bacteria. But again, the entire phenomenon is not uh, not, not known. So 
a great area for uh, for research. And it's only on the surface. It's only something that we can actually observe. Back to the space and uh, heading towards extraterrestrial stuff. So, have you ever heard of something called SRBs? SRBs stands for, okay, I don't seem to, so maybe pen tool this time. F R B. FRB is the abbreviation of fast radio burst. They are like millisecond blips of something very intense and unexplained signals, radio signals. And they appear all over the sky and they come from million, 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 million uh, places million times farther away than our galaxy. And it's, uh, it hasn't been researched for a long time because before 2013, many astrophysicists even doubted they even existed. But um, in the years uh, since, they were observed. For example, they were observed by uh, this radio telescopes in, in Canada. It detected 13 radio, radio bursts. So uh, they can be observed, and there are dozens of possible explanations. Actually, there are 48 theories. They, uh, the FRB's fast uh, radio burst um, look a little bit like now. It, lo it looks like nothing but a buzz. Uh, but it's a buzz, like a signal coming from really far away. Is it a signal of intelligent uh, um, civilization may be able to build such uh, such equipment? Are they trying to tell us something and we just cannot understand the language? These are all the possibilities that we need to uh, consider. Um, and uh, again, coming back to our very close uh, area, what makes us human? Even though we uh, we are very we are developing like a genealog uh, genealogical tree of uh, of humans. We still don't know what is exactly that makes us human. And I'm not talking about the features, because the features are well known, like naked skin, hairless skin. Uh, we have opposable uh, thumbs that help us grab things. Well, other primates have them too. We are standing uh, upright. We are walking on two feet. Uh, we have a huge brain. Uh, the brain, uh, the ratio brain versus our mass is 1 to 50. Normally, it's to 180 in other organisms. We have our imagination, creativity, we're aware of death, we have various religions or spiritual beliefs. We are able to tell stories, to memor the memorial stories and to create culture and so on. So these are all the threads that we know that uh, differ us from other uh, animals. But actually what is the crucial part um, because it must be in DNA, but just looking at your DNA won't tell you, because the human genome is not only 99% identical to the chimpanzee, our closest um, cousin. It's actually 50% uh, uh, identical as bananas. Uh, we do have bigger brains. Uh, we have lots of neurons in our uh, in our brains. Actually, we have like um, three times as many neurons as as gorilla, for example, with the same skull. So, uh, but what in this DNA makes us so special and uh, differs us from this to this, and even better, or to this? This is still uh, still a secret. So. Um, Probably uh, what makes, so what gives us this capacity for cooperation, those skills that make this a planet of humans and not planet of, and maybe not bananas, but of apes, for example. This is still to be discovered, but hey, 30 years ago, no one used DNA for, for, for example, uh, 
criminology, so it's developing really, really fast. And again, we mentioned extraterrestrials a couple of times, and I'm not really going to talk about little green men. You know it from science fiction, probably very, very well. Uh, the question, are we alone, has been with us forever. And of course, uh, some people claim that uh, they even saw extraterrestrials, they, uh, um, that we were visited by extraterrestrials, that we were visited in the past. Um, but the, the, the thing is, there's something that we call the Fermi Paradox. The Fermi Paradox means that it's like, like a probabilistic um, thing. So the Fermi Paradox says there is high, very high probability that there, is, there are other civilizations, that there is life and other intelligent civilizations in the universe. But the paradox is we lack the evidence. So the probability is really high and the evidence is none. Not really. Uh, so this is one thing. And what you see here is actually an equation. So somebody, it was Frank Drake, created, developed a mathematical equation called Frank Drake equation, obviously. And it looks uh, like this. Here are the elements that are in this, um, in this equation explained. Uh, well, it takes into account many things like uh, star formation in our galaxy, number of planets, which planets could support life. So we're narrowing this this number, and actually, what we the result is this, <laughs> uh, which means, uh, and of course, it also takes the length of time um, for which civilization is detectable because this mathematical equation does not only count is how probable it is that there is life but how probable it is that we will be able to contact life they, they will reach out to us and we will receive the signal so this is why it takes into account also the length of time for which civilization um, is detectable in space for, because for how long have, are we detectable uh, in the space for not this long Let's say since 1974, more or less, we were not detectable from the uh, universe in 19th century. So maybe there are civilizations that are not detectable yet. So according to this equation, even if we disappear as a civilization in 2074, there is, according to this equation, 10 intelligent civilization, civilizations that we could contact only in our galaxy, in our galaxy, so quite, quite close. Uh, talking about those um, galaxies and civilizations, there is uh, some other term they would like to, to know. It's so-called Kadashev scale. Kadashev scale is something that splits intelligence life into three categories. So depending on uh, how they use energy, uh, for example, how they con in general, how they control and host the, the energy. And we are actually uh, type, um, type 1. Uh, type 1 means that we are able to use all the energy available on our planet. We're not, we're like a scale of 70%. So we're not totally type 1, but more or less we are, we are so. So we are searching for similar Mm, civilizations in our galaxy and further. So just to end today's lesson, uh, the question is where are the limits? So how much can we really know? Are we going to learn the answers to all the questions posed today or any time now? Uh, where there are some limits. There's time, there are costs, uh, technology, but they're all developing. Uh, we can have more time for research, we can have better equipment, we can more, have more funding, but two things will never change in terms of research. First of all is that what we observe is not actually the phenomenon or nature, it's what nature is exposed to our method. So it's 
not the temperature that we observe, but the temperature, the, but the state exposed to our thermometer. It's and so on and so on. So it also it's also the the matter of method and how maybe it changes uh, the environment. And this is where we get the, the other limitation. So science requires interaction with the system that we're studying. And with every interaction, we are somehow disrupting the system. So we never know what it would be without the interaction. Well, there are some uh, limitations that for now we cannot um, deal with. And just to end with uh, some positive uh, stuff, well, maybe the, this photo is not the, most, the cutest one. Uh, but actually, I wanted to show you uh, a result of a study, a recent study, that brings us closer to one of the biggest questions that there is. Is it possible to be immortal? Is it possible not to age? Is it possible to beat all the diseases, to be immune to cancer, for example, or other diseases? So there was a breakthrough, a serious breakthrough, thanks to this little fellow. I don't know if you recognize it. It's, uh, it's a naked mole rat, a very popular animal recently, not a cute one, like I said. Um, actually, uh, naked mole rats, they live in underground colonies. They like, look like something between a rat and a mole. So it's naked mole rat. Uh, they live in the deserts of East Africa. And the, they are basically immortal. Well, it's not correct because they die eventually. But the studies show that it doesn't matter how old they are. They have the same rate of dying. It would mean that uh, if, it if it was the human's case, it, was e if it, it would be equally likely to die at 30 as at 90. The same, the same chance to die. Uh, so quite incredible. So the, the scientists are not yet 100% sure why they always die, because they die eventually. Uh, well, they are uh, caught by predators, of dehydration, of hunger, of accidents. But there's nothing like a natural death uh, for them, uh, we might say. Uh, so why is that? Well, the scientists discovered this one. And this is a, a protein. And usually the proteins are the answer to questions like that. So, so we, this protein is called uh, hyaluronan, HA. And it seems to have anti-cancer properties, according to recent research. And um, this makes this little make more rat to hold the integrity of the proteins throughout their whole life. That's why they don't age. They look like they're old all the time, but they don't actually age. So their bodies seem to protect their genomes from damage. They clear away all cellular mutations that, that cause some diseases like cancer, for example. So this is a study that gives us hope to conquer a very serious disease and maybe someday which seems like a dangerous to combat mortality. 